Hey Chuck, great to see you again. It's good it's, to be uh, here, Steve. 365 days, in <laughs> fact, since I last saw you. Um, how do you feel things are going and, and, and what do you think this state of the communications market is right now? Uh, and, and what is Cisco's role today in that market? Well, Steve, it's, first of all, it's an incredibly exciting time in technology and you can see it here at Mobile World Congress. It's just the innovation and the pace of change is unprecedented. Yeah. And while we look back at the last 20 years and think, that, wow, what, what we've accomplished and what we've built I think it's nothing compared to what we're going to do over the next decade. Yeah. You know, we believe that by 2020 there there's going to be well over 25 billion connections to the internet. So we're connecting everything from, you know, vehicles to vending machines to mine mining operations to oil rigs. Yeah. And so first and foremost it's about enabling all of that intelligent secure connectivity, but more importantly, I think the real opportunity for us is to help our customers actually process all this information, you know, determine which pieces of it have tremendous value, yeah. what time and where in the network they have value, yeah. and then gain the insights from that. So we're, we're embarking on an unprecedented opportunity that I think is going to be very good for us. So we're, we're very excited. Yeah, I mean, the, the world, not just our industry, is on a journey here. I mean, it's transforming. And in fact, what we do for a living, I mean, I like to say I used to write about expensive, you know, uh, equipment for connecting expensive office equipment. That's not really what we do anymore, is it? I mean, actually, no. next generation communications and, and global society are indivisible, right? So it's, right. it's a big mission. The world is on this journey. Cisco's on a journey as well, isn't it? I mean, you know, one of the changes which I see is that Increasingly, you seem to be a software company more than a hardware company. Is that an accurate description? Do you think? Yeah. For, first of all, I want to. I, I agree with you that I think we're we're on the front end of the possibility to change the world with this technology, to provide unprecedented opportunity for people who hadn't had it before, to perhaps solve issues relative to water and agriculture, and just phenomenal opportunities for all of us. So we're excited yes. about that. As it relates to Cisco, you know, if you look at our history, we, we've actually been a software company. Uh, we just sold it we, through a product. Yeah. So, uh, you know, some 75 to 80 percent of our engineers are software engineers. Uh, and as, as more and more of our customers look to solve problems in, with software, and we look at how can we create, you know, agile methodologies for you know, rapid feature development. Uh, we are increasingly delivering a lot of our solutions via software. Right. So, uh, you know, we've, we've seen great success in our software and our SaaS businesses, our, our cloud delivered businesses. And, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about that on our earnings calls and how it's uh, contributing to our deferred revenue balances. And so, yeah, we've, we've had a big focus on it going forward. Yeah, that's interesting. Another thing which has been fascinating here at Mobile World Congress is to learn of course, that we've managed to warp the space-time continuum and we're actually bringing 5G forward a year. 2019, I mean, yeah. we've never actually achieved that as an industry with a G standard before. It's happening because of demand, isn't there, it? There and is that's, demand. That's exciting. Uh, you know, is that a big part of Cisco's future? Is it a big part of your customer's future? Where does it fit? Well, if you look at what's happening today, with IoT and all of these new connected devices, there's just this massive you know, desire for more and more bandwidth around the world. And I think that's what a lot of the providers here are seeing is that there's this insatiable demand for connectivity as well as bandwidth. And yeah. so 5G, low latency, high performance, it provides this tremendous access so it provides the ability to deliver high performance, last mile connectivity yeah. uh, via wireless as opposed to thinking about having to build out fiber as an example. So we think not only is it a great opportunity for classic connectivity, but we also have been showing here, it allows us to enable our service provider customers to actually deliver virtualized services over those connections, high performance services, because the bandwidth's going to be there, the latency's going to be appropriate. And so not only is it about the connection, we think the security, you know, getting uh, the, the services delivered, 
Right. And the other thing that is going to require is as you put so much bandwidth out at the edge, it's fundamentally going to require us to re-architect and increase the bandwidth of the overall network. So. Yeah, there are two sides to every equation, and yeah. you know, in the core, that's going to be fantastic for your business, isn't it? We um, would like to think so. Yeah, yes. I'm sure it will be. And, and you know, uh, uh, another thing which I thought was uh, obviously very impressive is this acquisition of Jasper and uh, uh, the growth that that company has seen. I guess it's about a year since you've owned it, and, yes. and it's now handling about four times as many IoT connections as it was uh, previously. Is that even surprising to you? Were you expecting to see that kind of growth from the IoT business? You know, we, we have been calling for this exponential growth mm. of IoT connections, and I think that's what we're seeing. The machine-to-machine -machine platform that Jasper is you know, when we bought them 11 months ago, they had yeah. 17 million connections, and today they're over 40 million. There were 3,500 enterprises that were using data, and here we are 11 months later, there's 9,000. So we've been adding 500 you know, new enterprise customers a month who yeah. are actually, the, the assumption is they're actually building applications that are processing IoT data. So in 2016, we really hit this inflection where the use cases became incredibly real. And I think what you find is that the, the return investment around some of these applications just it's just a no-brainer. Really? You know, when you think about preventive maintenance as an example, yeah. you, you connect elevators and you can solve the problems before they occur, yeah. or any device. Yeah. It, it's almost like that's the killer app like e-commerce right. was, you know, yeah. the initial, you know, in the 90s with the initial build-out. Absolutely. And if you can avoid a few maintenance calls, yeah. then, you know, the cost of building this stuff out is actually, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's it's just negligible in the yeah. big scheme of things. Yeah, so. it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And that's the type of application, of course, that service providers really need right that's now. That's exactly right. Yeah. Let's talk about the cloud for a minute. I mean, actually, at last year's show, NFV was the, obviously the acronym that was everywhere. An interesting yeah. thing happened around August or September last year. A lot of service providers, tier one service providers, uh, were telling me, hey, we're actually getting quite disillusioned with NFV and with virtualization because uh, it's quite hard to install it's quite hard to get the services and applications to run over it. Uh, and because of those two things, it's quite difficult for us to see the business case for it. You know, that's the underlying technology for cloud, and cloud is the future. Right. Um, you know, how do they feel about it now? And, and what's Cisco doing to help them on their journey to the cloud? Well, I think if you, if you look at what they were trying to accomplish, mm -hmm. they were trying to take technology mm -hmm. that had been delivered on premise and find a way to virtually deploy that with lower cost, greater speed, et cetera. And I think what we are beginning to do now is work with them to deliver more cloud native services. So yes. they're, they're built as multi-tenant cloud offers. They're built to be delivered from the cloud as opposed to us trying to make them uh, you know, delivered from the cloud. There's still a great opportunity for virtualized services, Huge. virtual managed services, yeah. and there's still use cases for NFV and we have but the virtualization, natural virtualization of the technology is, is really where we're going to go. And if you look at our packet core yeah. and what we've done with that, I think we have more deployments of virtualized packet core subscribers than, yeah. than anyone in the world. And those native built applications, I think, and the services that are native built to be delivered in a multi-tenant way from the cloud is where the future is, and that's what we're going to be doing for our service providers. That's where you're driving, yeah. yeah. Listen, Joe, let me ask you a question. It's been a little over a year since you've uh, you know, had the top job. I mean, you must have learned a few things in that time. What can you share? What, are there any leadership lessons that you've acquired over the last 12 months? You, you don't look any older, <laughs> so it must well, be going quite you're well. You're kind. Yeah, no. Uh, it's, uh, you, know, you know, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of adages about leadership that just truly come to life and become very personal when you're in this job. You know, the, the theory of loneliness. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there are moments where it feels yeah. kind of lonely. Yeah. Um, I think the other thing that's incredibly obvious, but it doesn't become clear until you actually really think about it is, I don't get any easy decisions. You know, I mean, the easy decisions get made. Yeah. And so it's, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, it's just a series of complicated <laughs> issues that we have to deal with. Um, the two other things I think That's is what that keeps it interesting. It is it is incredibly interesting. Yeah. Uh, the two other things I think are 
that uh, you know assumptions will always get you in trouble. You just can't make assumptions right. about anything. You really need to make sure you have data, and uh, and you really assess situations very deeply. And and the final thing I'll say is that you know it just regardless of where you are in your career, what level you achieve, the, the one thing that we always have to remember is that our people are our people. Right? Yeah. And because uh, we see executives who have great success, they're still human beings at the end of the day. And I think maintaining you know, the, the fun, the, the camaraderie, and really making sure that we're all still connecting as humans in this world where we're talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think that's actually more important now than it ever has been. And yeah. that's something that has just been, you know, it's been reiterated for me through the last year and a half, so. Yeah, it goes to culture. It really culture does. Culture is the defining really aspect does. of all success, I think. I really believe that. Yeah. So. I do too. Chuck, it's great to see you. Congratulations. Thank you, Steve. You know, I hope that, uh, hopefully, uh, I'll get to see you before another year goes out. Well, we're happy to sit down anytime and. Um, if not, we'll definitely do it right here again next Absolutely. year. How about that? See you back right. then. Thanks Thank so you. much, Chuck. Thanks.